It's the Garden Nerd Tip of the Week podcast, where we spend time chatting with expert gardening guests and we ask for their favorite tip. I'm Christy Wilhelmy. Thanks for joining me. My guest this week is one of the most well-known gardeners on television, Joe Lample. He's the host of the Emmy award-winning show, Growing a Greener World. He's spent the last 30 years helping people grow their own food on TV, his website, podcasts, and online courses. And his new book, The Vegetable Gardening Book, A Complete Guide to Growing an Edible Organic Garden from Seed to Harvest, has just come out. Welcome to the podcast, Joe. Thank you, Christy. It's great to be here. Yeah, and we are speaking across coasts right now. You're in Atlanta, and I'm I'm over here in Southern California. Um, I was really delighted when Jessica Walliser, our publisher from Cool Springs Press, introduced us by email. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I feel like our lives have run similar paths, but you know, you you've had this incredible television show for the last what is it, 13 years that's been on, going yes. on 14. Yeah. And, and I've been just trying to get my own gardening show for the last 20. So <laughs> I, I admire you for that. So that's wonderful. Um, well, can I just say, can yeah. I just say, I've seen some of your video and I've noticed that you have a very polished professional delivery. You, I don't know why it's, why, where, where the glitch is in that not happening. Cause not everybody can do that. And you, I noticed that right off the bat. And oh. so good, good for you. Thank you. Yeah. Lots of editing, I have to say. <laughs> no, this you weren't edited. You can't. What I saw wasn't edited. You it was a clean stand up one off one take wonder. So amazing. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. I, I think, you know, a lot of the time I'm shooting my YouTube videos in the morning before the sun gets uh, above the ridge. And so it's like I have the morning gravelly voice and I'm like hardly brain functioning at the time but you know it, it all works out and and the point i guess of our work is to deliver information to people so that they can grow food right right but i just said i want to put my tv production hat on too though it's funny though that you you make a comment to knowing the right time for the lighting yet you're dealing with the trade-off of your voice and how that <laughs> sounds and the light trumps the voice and all of that exactly that's so tv good for you yeah it is well it's funny because i was watching your some of your older older uh, uh shows and they you know the lighting is gorgeous and we're going to talk about your homestead in a minute but i i figured i would start by asking you before we get to the book too you described yourself as forever curious when you mm -hmm. first started gardening at eight years old so yeah. I, have to, I what are you curious about or what were you curious about then the fact that everything i see in nature blows my mind and it's like how did that happen you know it's like oh my gosh and then the next day it's something else which is all about why i think gardening to me is this addiction that becomes more powerful to me every day than the day before. And this is going back from age eight to where I am today and where I'm gonna be when I'm compost. I mean, every day is gonna be more of that because no matter how long you've been doing this, there's always more to learn. And if you just go out there and open your eyes and look around, you're gonna see something new. And that's what I love, getting up every morning, it's never boring and it's always different. And what's not to love about that? I mean. It could be worse. <laughs> yeah, it's true. And nature always keeps us on our toes. Oh, that's I love for sure. I know, right? Like I always tell my students, nature always wins. And so it's our job to just kind of work with her. Yeah. Um, you, you know what I say to that? Can I just dump Yeah, in? go ahead. Um, you know, I always say, um, Mother Nature always remind us, reminds us who's in control. But for me, the competitive, the com competitor in me always wants to give her a run for her money. I know I'm not going to win, but I always want to just make her sweat a little bit. Worth a try. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> right. I mean, we do our best, right? So, yeah. uh, well, so speaking of mother nature, you have this gorgeous five acre homestead in mm -hmm. Atlanta, Georgia, if I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. and you got yeah. 16 beds dedicated to vegetables that are featured on your show, which I'm completely mm -hmm. envious of because I have a lot less space. But um, I have to ask, are you planting for fall or just sh are you gonna be shutting down for the season? What's in your uh, timeline? Uh, thank you for asking that question. I am such a proponent of fall gardening. I am a big champion of that. And I want everybody to do it because it's such a missed opportunity if you don't. And I understand how we get so excited when spring comes around and we pour our heart and our soul and our money, everything into it, the blood, sweat and tears and whatever else comes with it. And frankly, by the time we get through that hot part of summer and our plants aren't looking so good and neither are we, 
we're <laughs> kind of over it for the season, you know? <laughs> so we throw in the towel and we're like, oh, I'm ready to take a break. But the best part is ahead of us. And that's what I'm afraid too many people just forget or don't even know about because they've never done it. But once the heat and the humidity and the pest and the disease cycles kind of wane, now you've got this the most incredible feeling and season and timing of the year to grow these things that don't even grow in the summertime that frankly are my favorite things to grow with the exception of tomatoes. Uh, and I don't really love growing tomatoes. I just love the challenge of it and eating them, of course. Um, so yes, to answer your question, every one of my 16 beds is completely planted out right now. And I'm so excited about it. I was standing out there. I go out every day that I'm not traveling and I stand there and I work in my garden. I spend time, but this morning I just, kind of stepped back and looked at a full, rich, planted out garden of raised beds. You know, everything's a few weeks in the ground now, so they're not tiny little seedlings anymore, but they're not where they need to be yet, of course. But it's just such a good feeling. It was such a peaceful sense of satisfaction to look at that and know what's ahead and just to feel really good about, you know, doing it, just getting it done. You know, it's a big, big task to take on 16 beds like that. And right after you're on the heels of ripping stuff out, right. you turn around and plan again, but the rewards are ahead and the rewards are every day too. So, yeah. yes. I, I just started three flats of brassicaceas for my mm -hmm. garden. And uh, because we're, we're a bit behind you. So I'm zone 10 B you're in eight A. Seven B ish. Seven B. Okay. So and you do get a frost. So are you protecting your crops uh, with floating row cover, insulated fabric, anything? I do. Um, I kind of put my plants through the, through the, um, <laughs> the ringer, the ringer. I, I make them, <laughs> I make them work and uh, we don't get, you know, we do get down into the mid twenties, mm -hmm. con you know, consistently, but I've found that everything that I grow makes it that far okay and then and then uh you know we get the occasional teens and even sometimes rarely a single digit but uh it, it's been a long time since i've had a really bad day in the garden from cold weather so yes occasionally i've got my my you know my fleece out there ready to go if i need to but it's the times that i apply it are few and far between okay good to know and you're mm -hmm. ra you're in raised beds so you're not growing in the ground so you're not getting as big of a, a frost issue as some people who would be growing in the ground right right yeah uh okay so let me ask you about your new book it's called the vegetable gardening book and i would say it's geared towards beginners right um what what was your goal when writing this book well um my goal was just really to inspire everybody that either has been growing food and wants to be a better, smarter, more confident gardener. That's kind of the line that I adhere to for everything. But I really wanted to um, empower the, the new gardener or that person that wanted to up their game or demystify whatever it is that's keeping them from starting or getting to that next level. And the way that I wanted to do that was to not speak over their head, to make it gardening approachable, to encourage them to just start and then allow me, if they will, to be their guide so that they can go through the process with my coaching and help along the way in, in a written way that made them feel like they were hanging out with me in my garden as I was teaching them how to do what I do so that they could do the same thing. So it was just kind of trying to be personal with them and make them feel as though I was talking to them in my garden was really kind of the overall approach. Yeah, and it feels that way. I think uh, when I was flipping through it, I was looking at uh, everything I was nodding at. I was like, yep, yep, this is great. This is, everyone should know this. This is good. This is perfect. And it just mm -hmm. kept going. And everything you you know included was really uh kind of the salient information that people need to get going all in one place, which is so helpful for a new gardener when they don't know where to look, because there's a lot of information out there. There's a lot. And, and really what I wanted to do in the first, I think it was 12 chapters, is break down all the key things to being not just a gardener, but an organic gardener. Mm -hmm. And so is the best practices and plus my experience over the all the years and in every all of this stuff to put that try to winnow that down into, you know, not as many words as we submitted. Unfortunately, we submitted more, but you know, there's that <laughs> dang word count. And yep. so there, a lot came out, but I understand that, but we had a lot more to say that didn't make it. Uh, 
which would have upped the level of what was there. But it's a really good handy guide. And for the people that have read it and looked at it so far, the feedback has been fantastic. And then the other thing, Christy, is that beyond the 12 chapters to get people thinking about the why do behind the how to, that's another one of these things I'm really big on is, you know, you can follow a recipe card and just do those steps to make the stuff happen. But do you really learn from that? What I want people to understand is by doing that, why do you do that? Why is that step in there? And what, because I do that, oh, once I get that, I know that I can apply that to the next thing. And that's how you become that better, smarter, more confident gardener is understanding the why do behind the how to. Right. So that, that all comes together there. And then the other part of the book is the um, Fab 40 that I call it, the top 20 and top, top 20 warm and top 20 cool season edibles. And kind of the baseball card format on the quick and dirty, or I call it the down and dirty of the basic things you need to know. And then the anecdotal information from my years of growing that crop and other important information. So it's kind of an at a glance, quick guide to a couple pages dedicated to each thing to help them, you know, successfully grow that. Yeah. And I have questions about that, those fab 40 in a minute, but you, you know, you have your, your pest control chapter. And you mentioned that just because it's organic doesn't mean it's safe. Let's talk about that. Let's break yeah. that down. Okay. Well, credit goes to Dr. Jeff Gilman, one of my good friends, and he's just, he's been a great author and a great mentor to me, but something he said, he said it a few times in his books and in just our conversations, but he said, you know, cause we have that conversation bantering around just because it's organic. And he said, you know, snake venom's organic, but do you really want to drink it? <laughs> yes. There's a famous George Carlin, uh, there's a George Carlin bit where he says, dog poop is organic. <laughs> there you go. Say yeah, no more, right? Exactly, right. Uh, right. But so for me, the big, the big ones that come up are uh, copper spray and neem oil. Mm. Both are safe for organic use. However, yeah, yeah, copper however. spray, it, it persists. If you apply too much of it, it builds up in soils and then it doesn't dissipate because it's a heavy metal. So what are your, what are your, what's on your radar for things yeah. that you don't like? Yeah, that's very true. Well, what, what I really um, want to make clear to people is, you know, when you opt for something that's organic for pest control, that, 99% of the time that option that you pick doesn't know the difference between a good bug and a bad bug. You know, right. it's non-selective. It's, it's, it's um, efficacy is very high and it's broad spectrum, meaning that it's going to kill whatever it comes in contact with. So pyrethrum, for example, you know, from the chrysanthemum daisy, what could be wrong with that or what could be harmful with that? It's very darn effective in killing stuff, but there's a classic example of opting for something organic, but that doesn't, that doesn't do anything to help you save your beneficial insects out there. It's going to kill them too. Uh, and even insecticidal soap, which is approved oftentimes for organic control or uh, botanical oil or something like that, it smothers the pest or insect, insect that it comes in contact with. And if it's a soft body pest, it's going to suffocate it. And so that you've got your lady beetle larva out there and all of the, you know, the lace wings or whatever, mm -hmm you're not doing yourself any favors, nor are you doing your garden any favors or the biodiversity that you have that you're trying to, you know, promote. That's not helping. So I want people to understand that. And before they even reach for anything, stand back, observe, be patient. And, you know, if you have to reach for something, just reach for the bug. Once you identify that it's actually a pest and then knock it into a bottle of so a cup of soapy water or squish it or whatever you want to do, but the last thing I want you to do is even if it's organic, broad spray, thinking that that's going to help. Because as another good friend of mine, uh, Suzanne Wainwright Evans, who's a fantastic entomologist, told me one time years ago, she said, you know, the biggest way to increase your pest problem, do you know? And I said, what is it? And she said, just to spray pesticide because you're <laughs> killing you're killing all the bugs, which means the good and the bad and the bad have such a resistance to it, they come back stronger before the beneficials are ever aired there to show up again. So now it's a free-for-all buffet from the pest with no predators to take them out and your problem just gets worse. Right, exactly. So moving on to diseases, 
Uh, you share something in the book called the disease triangle made up of three points. Mm -hmm. What are those points and how do they influence us or rather how can we influence them or how do we influence them? Okay. So the diseases um, have their host specific. So it may be more than one, but let's just use the garden example. So we have the pathogen. So the three things are the pathogen, the conditions, the environmental conditions and the host. And all of those th three things have to come together for that pathogen to bloom or infect the plant and show itself. And until those three things come together, the pathogen may be there, the host may be there, but if one of the th three things is off, maybe the environmental conditions aren't there, it's, n it's not going to manifest itself. But then when it happens, that's when it happens. So um, if you adjust one of those three things and you know you can't necessarily prevent the pathogen from coming in but you could you know if you're tired of growing if you're tired of dealing with your tomato plants because they get the same diseases all the time you know maybe you take a break from growing tomatoes for a year maybe you find that there's a certain disease that keeps showing up and maybe you find out that it's from the soil and so if you just move the environment and change the where the tomato is growing into clean soil you may be able to short circuit that disease triangle and eliminate that problem in the future or temporarily at least. At so, least, yeah. yeah. And I think that the message in this, uh, in this triangle is really calming for people who are terrified of bugs. And I, I get people all the time are like, I found an aphid on my whatever. And it's like, it's okay. It's yeah. one little bug. It's okay. <laughs> and, you know, or a tiny little hole eaten in one of their leaves. And they're like, I have to throw the whole plant away. I'm like, no, no, it's not like that. So it, it really gives people a sense of what needs to be in place for that to happen and how you can shift it so that you don't have to deal with it as, as urgently as you think you do. Right. And, and yes. And I understand. I mean, I really have a heart for the beginning gardener and the, and the people that are trying to do better. And they, they're so excited. You know, the enthusiasm is through the roof and then they, they want everything to be as good as they can make it. And, and they haven't been around the block enough times to know that they're not in control <laughs> and that pests and diseases will come. Yep. And it's not usually fatal. You know, like with with pest, you can go out there and see 35 to 40 percent damage on your foliage and your plant still can photosynthesize and it can still do what it was programmed to do through its DNA. Mm -hmm. It may take a little bit longer and it may work a little bit harder and the output may not be as glorious as if it had perfect foliage, but that's not gardening. So what I'm trying to do through all the different ways that I can reach people is to help them understand that, hey, it's okay. You know. Things are going to be all right and take it from me because I've, I've gone down that road a few times. <laughs> I've seen it. And like when I see that in my garden, I don't even, I don't think twice about it because I know that it's going to be OK. But you don't yet. But I want you to hear from me that it's OK and, and just chill, you know, in a nice way. It's OK. Yeah. So you've got you mentioned earlier this profile you've done for 40 different vegetables toward the end of the book including popular items like tomatoes and melons, as well as some perennial veggies like artichokes and asparagus. Mm -hmm. I know this is like asking who's your favorite child, but what of those 40 are your favorite things to grow? Okay. That's, I love that question. I mentioned tomatoes and I, and I don't want to give the wrong impression because it's the one thing I grow more of than anything else. And I love eating heirloom tomatoes so does my wife and everybody I know. So it's fun to grow them all and give them away. But you know what I love about it is in spite of all the challenges, and that's it's a love-hate thing because here in the Southeast where it's hot and humid during the peak time that tomatoes are growing, it is hard to get a tomato plant to grow through the first few tomatoes without it succumbing to some one of many diseases. Same in spite here. Of, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, in spite of your best efforts. And I'm very proactive about it. I talk about it all the time. As you see diseases coming on, remove the pathogens from spreading and cut all that stuff out. But when you're growing 60 or 70 plants, that's a lot of work to be on it every day with every plant. And you get tired of that. It's not fun after a while. But the stubbornness in you keeps persisting. And so you you power through it. But you know, you're not 
all that disappointed when it's time to pull them out, even though they they could keep going. You just I my justification is it's time to make room for the fall planting. So these guys got to come out. Yeah. So that said, out of the 65 or so that I grew this year, I have two still growing in my garden that look really great. They've made it through and they get to stay, but the rest are out. So tomatoes. Mm -hmm. I love peppers. And so from a summer crop standpoint, the other thing that I love growing, I think the best is um, edamame, soybean, because I just love eating it. It's easy to grow. It's not many pests are, are attracted to it. And so it's a nice respite from all the work you're doing to manage, you know, God forbid you're growing cucurbits or, you know, for me, that's just the one that I grow that I, every year I say, I'm not going to grow it <laughs> anymore. <laughs> Yeah, I guess squash beetle is a big problem where you are. Squash vine borer, squash beetles, all of the above, the yeah. prickliness of the leaves, reaching in there to deal with it. Uh, yeah. So, anyway. so that's a not so favorite. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I, I uh, It's hard for me to not grow everything because I, I have the room and I like, I like, I feel that it's important for me to continue to stay on top of the challenges that other people are going through at the same time so that I'm in their camp with them in mm -hmm. real time. And so I, I do pretty much grow everything there is to grow in warm and cool season crops just to see what's going on this year versus last year. So it's kind of a laboratory too, but, but on the cool season, that's really where my favorite stuff is because I love all the leafy crops. I love the spinach. I love the arugula. I love my lettuce. Of course, I love all the brassicas. Um, there's not much I don't love when it comes to cool season crops. I love beets. I was yeah. going to say, do you have a favorite root vegetable? I right? love beets. beets. I love beets. I grow a lot of them. Yes. All right. Great. Yeah. yeah. I have a, I grow 16 varieties of kale every year. If that oh. tells you anything about me. I just like, it's all about kale. You know, I, I, I was growing a lot of different varieties of kale, but down, now I'm just down to my large curly leaf kale that I use for saute and smoothies. And it's just, it's the one I love the most. And, and there are other ones that are, you know, I think it's pretty. The kale that I grow is really pretty. But, um, I just, I just, I, you know, the, the more I garden and the older I get, I, I, I love to experiment. So I'm always growing out new stuff, but I have matured a little bit in recognizing that I don't have to grow everything all the time. And so with kale, that's one example this year, I just finally decided to just grow one, one in my bed. I grew out a lot of different seedlings from seed, but I didn't plant all the different varieties. Got it. Well, there's no harm in that. I think, uh, you know, variety for me is part of the excitement that keeps yes, me motivated. Because you talk about like, we've been around the block a few times, like, it's kind of gardening is always keeping you on a, on your toes. But I get I can get bored if I don't have something new yeah. to grow that I've never tried before. So mm -hmm. I, I think I'm jaded and sad in that way. But it's fine. I it, the reward is something new and different. So that's fine. I 100% agree with that. Yeah. All right. It is tip time. Do you have okay. a favorite tip that you'd like to share with the garden nerd audience? <laughs> oh man. So um, many, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. you know what? Okay. What? If you don't have anything in mind, I want to talk to you about your tomato cages because we've done something okay. similar, but yours are fancier, nicer looking than what I've come up with. Okay. Well, yeah. let's make that a tip. I mean, I, I right. got a lot of tips, but let's do that one because okay. it's a fun one to talk about. Yeah. So you have these, you use, we use the same material. Uh, okay. it's, you call them cattle panels. I or call livestock it, panel. Yeah. Livestock panel. Uh, mm -hmm. I call it mix mat or whatever it is that you lay down in the driveway before you pour concrete in it. That's my oh, description. Oh, well, okay. That is, it. Is your um, galvanized steel? Yeah, it is. It's, it's six by six opening or seven by seven opening. Um, Something like that. Yeah. And, and so those make the best cages because... They, super strong they're strong and well you talk about your cages because you have a total how-to in the book yeah. on how to make them go ahead and a video yeah and yes, a video you that you can watch doing it so the the evolution of that cage came about because growing so many tomatoes over all the years and most of mine are indeterminate so they keep on growing and it's like how the heck do i tame these things and keep them looking good and not way outgrowing the container or the the cone or whatever it is that you buy and um, the the next best thing or the best thing up to the point before I created these ultimate tomato cages, as I call them, was just the the concrete reinforcing wire that comes in the big rolls that's not galvanized because it rust. Uh, so that's not what you use, right? You use true galvanized panels. Uh, you know, mine 
do rust actually. Okay. So probably that's, not. <laughs> well, that's why I asked you because that is what people put down before they pour concrete. They roll that stuff out and it reinforces the concrete. And that is very common and very good. It works well. It's, you know, you can make it any diameter that you want and it's tall enough and all of that. So I have nothing but good things to say about it, except that for me, Part of the reason I needed to find something different was for my television garden, aesthetics was always important and I love quality. And I also didn't like how they stored in the wintertime because they had that memory and they want to just continue to stay in a, a circle <laughs> or a hoop. And it's like, if you grow as many tomatoes as I do, where do you store all that stuff? You know, that's a big high stack. Yeah. If you're, you know, so anyway, um, being on the hobby farm and having that livestock or uh, cattle panel around, I one day said, I've got to think of a better way. And I was looking at the panel and I thought, you know, I can bend that stuff. And and it had the height and the, and, the, and the fact that it wouldn't rust. And I figured if I could just create two basically L-shaped pieces, I could put them into the garden where they, you know, their corners all meet. Now it's a nice square panel made up of two pieces and it's galvanized. So it's not going to rust. And because they're L-shaped, you can just lay them down on the ground, face down, and then you can just stack one on top of the other, on top of the other, on top of the other. So I have 60-something cages now, which is 120 pieces That's that stack on, <laughs> stack on top of each other. And, a, and, and the total stack is maybe five feet when they're just all stacked on top of each other on a footprint that's maybe six feet long and a 18 inches wide. Yeah, it's great. And so the the... I think for me, what I've always seen at Home Depot as, labeled as cattle panel is uh, smaller than an even six by six or seven by seven with the holes. This is the grid we're talking about, folks. Mm -hmm. um, they're usually, you can't quite get your hands through it. It's narrower. It's like three inches by two inches or something like that. And so I, was, I wasn't sure if that's what it was called, but livestock panels, look for it. Those are the, and the galvanized version, which makes yes. it more rust resistant. Yeah. And you, and you get it at like tractor supply or farm supply stores. Cause that's, that's, that's who's buying that stuff, you know, yep. but well, many people have discovered that it has great application in the garden and those small squares that you described that are two or three inches, that'd be very frustrating for people to try to get their hands through yeah. or cut out disease foliage. I would, I would not do that. Yeah. That's too hard. And, it, yeah. and you'd have to send your children out to do the work, which is oh, oh. <laughs> child labor. Let's not do that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, well, that, that is a great tip. I'm going to point to where the, uh, that video is because I, I watched it and I have to go find it again, but I'll point to that in the show notes. Thank you so much, Joe, for being on the Garden Nerd Tip of the Week podcast. You are so welcome. This was a fun conversation. Thanks sure. for having me. So how do people find you? Which is a stupid question, I know, but how do it's people not. find you? <laughs> no, fortunately, it's easy. JoeGardner.com will get you to my main website, which has links to the podcast and the Online Gardening Academy and all the other stuff and the videos. And there's there's plenty there. And then as far as social media, you know, we've got plenty of channels that we're involved in, but I hang out on Instagram. And so that's at Joe Gardener as well. And um, that ought to get you where you need to go. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks so much. You're All right. Welcome. All right, Garden Nerds, you'll find a link to Joe's website on GardenNerd.com this week. We'll also share links to the book and his show, Growing a Greener World. That's it for this week. Subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. Visit us for tons of free gardening information at GardenNerd.com. Show your support for this podcast and the other free stuff on Garden Nerd by becoming a Patreon subscriber. And you'll find us on Instagram and Twitter under GardenNerd1, on Facebook as GardenNerd.com, and of course, our Garden Nerd YouTube channel. Happy gardening!